week we are studying every pastor equipping. This is a good chapter for us to uh, learn from as we set our expectations by God's word of what a pastor should be doing. Tom Rainer uh, was a pastor for a bit, and he had polled his deacons at the church that he was a pastor of in St. Petersburg, Florida, <laughs> about how much time he could he should be spending as their pastor each week on certain categories, on church-related prayer, sermon prep, counseling, evangelism, visiting people, administration, church meetings, and worship services. So he asked his deacons, how much time should I be spending on each of these categories? In the end, his deacons told him, on average, he should be spending 114 hours a week on these all these tasks. So if he took one day off a week, he would work 19 hours a day based on his deacon's expectations of what he should be doing and how much time he could be spending. The idea was, his conclusion was, clearly no one can ever humanly meet all those expectations. And I would add human expectations. We all have expectations of pastors. And again, us being without one is a great time for us to think about what the Bible says a pastor should be doing. We should align our view of the pastor and his role to what God says a pastor should be doing. The pastor is not a CEO. Right? CEOs run companies. Uh, a pastor is not a CEO. The main idea here is pastors equip church members, which causes the body to grow. That's the main idea. In our verse this evening that we're going to study, the Bible says that God himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why did he do that? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Who's doing the work of the ministry? The saints. Who's doing the equipping? The people prior in that first verse for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. So five types of people. The author says there's two groups that we can, uh, three groups we can fit these people in. Establishers, equippers, and members. Establishers are the apostles, the prophets, and evangelists. The equippers are the pastors and teachers. And the members, the church members, are the saints. Icons on the wall of our community. So, what are apostles, according to the Bible? Apostles were chosen by Jesus Christ personally. He knew them by name. He called them. He, uh, they all were eyewitnesses of his resurrected body. The only one that he did not call was the replacement for Judas, Matthias. But, every single one of them all saw with their own eyes the resurrected Christ, including Paul on that road to Damascus. What did apostles do? Well, they proclaimed the gospel. They organized believers in local assemblies. They enlisted men to serve as pastors. Paul tells Titus, uh, you need to pick some men to be pastors over this island of Crete. Paul tells Timothy, you need to train up men to, to pass along the gospel. Paul, as the apostle, is doing this. He has the authority. Now, this is not a controversial statement, but apostles, that position was not handed down. There was a specific number of apostles, and when they died, there were no more apostles. Why? Because all the apostles were chosen by Jesus Christ personally. All of them saw the resurrected Christ. And at that formative time, the beginning stages of the church, they, they laid that foundation. Okay, So if somebody comes and tells you that they are an apostle, 
that you, you can tell them that that's not what the Bible says. There's no passing down. Paul didn't say, now Titus, you're an apostle. I just didn't say, now you're an apostle. Peter didn't say, now I've named these men apostles, so you better follow them. They're not passed down. This is not a title that is passed down. It's nonsense if you call yourself an apostle. Second, so that's uh, Rembrandt's uh, painting of the Apostle Paul. It's a little dark, but you can't see it. So. It's not what Paul looked like. Or, you know. <laughs> Rembrandt, he was an apostle. It was passed down to him. Second, prophets. Now, prophets took God's words and proclaimed them to people. Priests would take people's words and proclaim them to God. Prophets. So we have apostles, we have prophets. And again, at this stage, they deliver God's truth before the Bible is written completely. We have the Old Testament, but we don't have any of the, the letters. We don't have any of the Gospels. We don't have the, the revelation of Jesus Christ that finishes out the New Testament. The main message that these prophets were given were that Gentiles and Jews both had equal access to God now. The, the curtain had been torn. Mm -hmm. There was now no Greek, no, no uh, uh, Jew. They were all one in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says the, the, the role of a prophet is a higher gift than the role of having this idea of speaking in another language, tongues. Why? Because it proclaimed God's truth to the broadest possible audience in the clearest possible way. We no longer need this position because, again, of the written word of God. Many people are duped or fooled by people who call themselves prophets. They are not prophets. They are con men. They are cult uh, uh, starters. There is no need for prophets today. We have everything that God wants us to hear and to know in God's word. Half the time, we don't even know what God's word says. So don't go to some person that says, oh, I'm a prophet, I've heard from God. No, you haven't. So we, we don't need apostles. That wasn't handed down. So no more apostles. Prophets, we don't need a prophet anymore. God's told us, uh, you know, have you ever thought of this? Okay, so... The whole Mormon religion is started by uh, this guy, Joseph Smith, who's a you know, prophet. But if the book of Revelation hasn't happened yet, and God gave us that future that hasn't happened yet, why would God come back, hypothetically, and give Joseph Smith more prophecy when he's already told us the end? It makes zero sense. That's the idea. These prophets, prophets are just making stuff up. So we no longer need this position because of the written word of God. All that we need to live a godly life is found in God's word. Third, evangelists. Now these are all the establishers of the church. And this is a painting of John the Evangelist. Evangelists, what did they do? Well, they were specially gifted with preaching the gospel effectively. They brought new assemblies of believers into existence, and they preached through preaching and personal witness. This is done by missionaries and church planters even today. So when we have evangelists come, their main message is to, to share the gospel in ways that the Bible gives them, and in ways that we may not have thought of before, but to reach people with the gospel. We still need evangelists today. So those were the establishers. So what are we talking about when we talk about uh, pastors and teachers? Those are the equippers, or the equipping of the saints. Now, pastors and teachers are, in many ways, the same sort of title. Uh, if you did a study over the requirements of pastors, able to teach is found there each time. So, 
pastor and teachers could be the same sort of idea. The pastor obviously preaches. The pastor obviously also teaches. Um, so it could be meaning the same thing. There's three titles in the New Testament for the office of pastor, pastor, shepherd, overseer. All of them indicate that uh, t that teaching role is key. So pastors shepherd the church spiritually and organizationally, providing oversight and leadership and pursuing the objectives laid out in Scripture for the church. And as teachers, they nourish the members and the whole church with truth from God's Word. So, what should the pastor be doing to bring growth to the church? Should he be visiting, witnessing, organizing outreach programs, preaching salvation messages, leading vacation Bible school, attracting new people with his winsome personality, life-touching sermons, and hip communication techniques? What does our passage say? The, passage, the pastor contributes to the growth of the church by the equipping of the saints. Now, some of us have in our minds, okay, what, is, what should an ideal pastor do? Well, he should be doing this, 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 and this. Okay, well, what the Bible says is that he should be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So, what does it mean to equip? Basically, it means to put something right. To restore it to the original condition so it can return to its proper function. On the screen, I have an uh, x-ray of a, a broken bone. Uh, it looks like the uh, pinky bone under here is broken and slanted over. I've never broken a bone, but I know some people who have, and it's quite painful. The idea of equipping is getting that broken bone set back right. How does that happen? Well, think of it this way. Many people uh, come to church broken. Um, if they're unsaved, their lives are filled with brokenness. Their hearts are broken. Um, maybe their marriage and their families are breaking up. Their relationships are broken through conflict, abuse, hurt, resentment, and bitterness. They are broken because of the most important piece of a complete life is missing Jesus Christ. So that's the idea of equipping, resetting the broken bone to the original purpose. As a pastor explains the Word of God, he helps people understand how they can adopt its truth and follow its instructions. He does this in public as well in personal discipleship and counseling meetings. Broken people who have new life in Christ find purpose and direction as they learn the word. The instruction they receive helps them live in a way that follows God's purpose and will. We are reconciled to God, back into a right relationship with him, and given a purpose that was originally, should have been given to us, but sin came along and ruined it. So that's the idea of equipping, resetting a broken bone. So when we share the gospel, when the pastor preaches, when the pastor witnesses, when, when we witness, we can help people uh, reset the brokenness of their lives. We can improve their lives. Second picture of equipping. This word, the same word that is translated equipped, in Greek literature, is used as a refitting a vessel that's been worn and damaged by use at, of the sea. You know, salt water and wind and you know, barnacles and mermaids and all those things damage a boat, right? <laughs> One of those things is fantastic. I'm just seeing who's listening. <laughs> One person was. The idea is, as you would bring it back into port, the, the people would go to work on resetting the beams, replacing the worn lines and the sails. Now, how is this similar? Well, as Christians, we have been uh, weathered by trials and, and conflict and time. 
Uh, we need to be equipped, restored to a right condition so we can fulfill our intended function. The purpose is not so, so we feel better. That's the problem with inspirational messages. It's not just to, oh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. No, it's so that we have the courage and the strength to serve God. Uh, the USS California was sunk when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And in March 24, 1942, 107 days after being sunk, she was raised back to the surface. Workers spent six months removing equipment damaged by salt, salt water, washing and rewashing the decks and walls with cleaning solution, drying and testing out every piece of equipment, doing everything necessary to return the ship to an operable condition. The USS California then steamed to Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington, where thousands of men and women worked on the ship for another year to restore her to full fighting capability. The USS California rejoined the Pacific Fleet of the U.S. Navy and fought successfully in seven battles in World War II. Do you ever feel like you've been bombarded and torpedoed by the world, <laughs> your flesh, and the devil himself? God has provided renewal and restoration through the ministry of the body of Christ in your life. Pastors have a key role in this renewal and restoration. God can fix useless believers and make them whole again. Amen. The third picture of equipping. When, um, when Jesus comes to uh, James and John, they are mending their nets. The same word translated mending is the word that we have for equipping. These two fishermen were repairing nets torn by the weight of fish hauled over the boat's sides. The pastor's faithful, clear, and practical ministry of the word can have a similar restorative effect on believers who are worn by the constant weight of responsibility and care of life. Now, when a when a fishing net is mended, is it so that it can be uh, a decoration on the inside of a red lobster? <laughs> no, you wouldn't waste time on fixing that net. In the same way, God uses church to return you to top condition so that you can fulfill your God-given function in the body of Christ and the world around you. Equipping is to restore to a right condition so that you can fulfill your purpose. The pastor's primary role in growing the body of, church, uh, of Christ is to teach and preach the Word of God. When the disciple, when the apostles, uh, the first church in Jerusalem, they had all these administrative tasks, they had widows that needed to be taken care of. And so they said, well, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We'll pick up these deacons and we'll have them do these texts because it has to be prayer and the ministry of the word that we have to focus on. Why? Because they need to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So let's go back to our expectations of the pastor. What should the pastor do? Well, he needs to do this, 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 and this. The Bible says he needs to be the equipper of the saints. Think specifically about a pastor's ministry of the word, including sermons and in teaching settings. What are you looking for as you attend these functions? Is there a conscious or subconscious expectation that a pastor will make you feel good about yourself? Expand your knowledge. Stimulate and challenge you intellectually. Help you with life problems. Emphasize your favorite doctrinal fine points? Make you proud of your church? Or do you view your pastor's ministry of the word as the means to equip you to fulfill God's purpose? Now, when we are asked to help with the responsibilities in the church, do we think, well, why doesn't just the pastor do it? No, we can't say that. Right? <laughs> but we could in the past. Why doesn't he do that? What's he doing with his time? Or, 
Are we glad to take care of the needs in the life of the church so he can focus his time on preparing to feed the flock with the word? Again, his task is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We can help our pastor's ministry of the word effectively by being humble and teachable when he preaches and teaches. We are growing ourselves. When the word does its work in us, we are progressively changed to fulfill God's purpose and to do his will. As this happens, we contribute to the life and growth of the church. So we have to allow the pastor's ministry of the word to equip us. Pastors bring growth to the church by investing a major amount of time and diligence into preparing and delivering message from God's word. And that's what we have to understand, that that's the pastor's primary goal, to equip us. So, what do we expect from our pastor? We should expect him to equip us for the work of the ministry, to mend our nets, to encourage us when we are uh, discouraged, to, to renew our purpose as ambassadors, or to set us right in areas that we acknowledge are broken, but we don't want to address. Uh, and he does that through the word, uh, not through hobby horses or side comments, but through God's word directly. He sets us right and puts us back into a place where we fulfill our purpose. We're here for a short time. So, Next week, we'll talk about every member ministry. All right, that'll be for next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We do ask that you would bring to us a, a pastor. And Lord, while we wait, that you would help us to understand what a pastor should be and what he should be doing. Lord, help us to use your word in a way that is uh, honoring to it, uh, one that is uh, taking it as your word. And so, Lord, help us to learn and to grow as we wait for you to work. In Jesus' name.